Business is messy and unpredictable. Sometimes lonely. So lonely. So lonely. (laughs) And inspiration can often come from really weird places. We pick up where the bullet point blogs and the highlight reels leave off. We start with the stories. Welcome back to So Here's My Story. I'm Jody. I'm Elliot. And we are back. And we are back. And before we get started on anything, I I just have to get something off my chest. (laughs) All right. So I have an Apple Watch and I got the Apple Watch because it has these health apps to it. So uh, when I started working out, got getting serious about it, it has exercise and calories burned and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's actually very helpful and I like it. And it's, it's kind of motivating in a weird way. So anyway, for the past day or two, um, after having, I been going to the gym five days, you know, Monday through Friday and then some on the weekend. So I've been really good about this, but for the past day or two, I've had the stomach flu. And so I haven't Mm. gone to the gym. And so this morning I, um, looked down, I got this little, you know, vibrating notice on my watch. I looked down and there was this message that said, you've normally burned more calories by this time during the day you might want to think about picking up the pace. And I was like, you know what? I don't need my watch throwing shade at me right now. That's pretty funny. Yeah, it, it was, was a little judgy. It was like, a little judgy. You're like, you didn't even ask if I'm okay. No, there was no, sick. no concern expressed. What like, I maybe you should be like, are you feeling okay? Yeah, yeah it was like, hey, what's buddy, going <laughs> what's going on? So, so basically, you want a workout watch with empathy. I do. I want, it, I want a workout watch. <laughs> It doesn't have to be motivational, like you can do it. Right. But every once in a while, you know, if it notices a decrease in activity, it shouldn't just jump to the conclusion that I'm being lazy. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, okay. You know, I'm sure Apple would really love to know that. Yes. Well, I'm sure they will because of the listenership of this um, podcast. That So you had, you know, had the stomach flu and you've had a really bad couple of weeks. I, I'm assuming yeah. that you're going to have a story out of Not that. Not the stomach flu. Not the stomach flu, but the other no. part of your really bad I week. I do have a story about the other part of my week, all right, yes. All right. I, I just presumed coming in today that you would likely have something yes. to play out. Okay, so so yes, we'll get to that in a minute. Why don't you thank our sponsors and then we'll get to the rest of your horrible week. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Who won't stay tuned for that? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, here's why you Doom stay tuned. Doom and gloom on its way. You can stay tuned because if you think you're having <laughs> a bad week, you just wait and you can walk away from this episode going, I don't have it so Life's bad. Life's not so bad. I'm not Elliot. So anyway, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Tom Loveland at Mind Over Machines, Cats Copy, the architecture firm of GWWO and Mary Craft Staffing and HR Solutions. All right, take it away. So here's my story. I was in the left turn lane leaving uh, the Wegmans shopping center and I was maybe second or third in line. I was behind a red light. So I was just kind of sitting there minding my own business. And to be honest with you, I was looking down and checking my email because the light was red and nothing was happening. When there was this crash and I was jolted and and I looked up to see that the Jeep that was in front of me had crunched my car. And And, and and you're sitting perfectly still. I was sitting perfectly still, but I'm not going to lie to you. At first I was thinking, because I was checking my email. (laughs) Did, Did I, I do my that? foot off the brake? But it was it was such. Did a, I accidentally gun it? <laughs> yeah, because you had to gun it. It wasn't just drifting. It was mm. it was an, an so impact. It wasn't a nudge. It was like a boom. No, because my hood was up. You know, so it oh. was folded, oh, wow. yeah. and you know, so I got out of the car, and the other driver got out too, and I'm looking, and I'm like, "Why are you backing up? <laughs> it's a red light. Why are you backing up?" And so he explained to me, and this is the point of the story, he explained we were in the left lane, but he realized that where he wanted to go required a right-hand turn. And so in order to do that, he needed, and this was the strategy, he needed to back up far enough that he could get past, there's a concrete median, get past the concrete medium, mm. and then cut across two lanes so he could go right. Mm-hmm. Um, and he figured that because other cars might be coming, he should do it fast. Okay. Right? So he's going to gun it. And so, anyway, $11,000 worth of just damage to not, my car just later. Just not carrying that? Or could he just not see He you? couldn't see me. Oh, okay. He couldn't he's see high, me. He's in low. a high Jeep. I have right. a low car. 
And and he was very nice about it. Um, you know, it was it was fine. It wasn't one Awfully of these gracious angry. Of him. Yes. Well, <laughs> it could have been this angry confrontation. But like he how accepted, dare you be sitting still behind my car? You know, he accepted full responsibility. He called the insurance company right away. He emailed me later to check in, make right. sure everything was okay. You know, you could have very easily fine. pretended that you rammed into the back he of him. Could in have, theory, and then we would have had an issue. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that didn't occur to him, and I'm thankful for that. <laughs> so. Anyway, it, um, all in all, it could have been a lot worse because nobody was hurt and, and it's just property damage and everybody's insured and it's fine. Sure. The reason that I bring this up, in addition to making our listeners feel better about how their lives are going. Right. So just just to recap, so that we, like so that that was a week ago, right? That was, that was a, week a week ago today. And since then, you've been down for three days with the stomach. Flu. Correct. Correct. What a lovely so week. It's been great. <laughs> but it it reminded me of certain things that I hear from executives and the way I felt when I was a member of Vistage. And that is that one of the issues that I see is that when you when you find yourself in a direction, when you find yourself in a lane, you have to stick to it. Hmm. You know, because if there's too much um, well, I'm over here. Now I'm going to back up and I'm going to go dramatically over to the right. Now I'm going to stop and I'm going to go dramatically over to the left. The reason that I mm. stopped with Vistage, for for example, Vistage was a great organization and they would bring in speakers every month that had really good ideas and really good concepts. And I realized that as motivated as I was to go with each one of their messages, if I came back to my small firm and started implementing each oh, one of these yeah. suggestions... It would it would give every single one of my employees whiplash oh, from yeah. going from this initiative to that initiative. To I, this I initiative. had those clients. It's exactly what they did, and it was it, it was it was it was gut wrenching to the organization. It is, and yeah. so sometimes I'm not saying that. And you and I had been speaking before the show about an analogy you brought up. You're, when you're running a company, you're rarely just at the top of the water slide with a whole bunch of tubes, picking the tube you're going to go down and stay in for the rest of your professional career. Right. That's not what I mean by picking the lane and sticking to it. But I do mean that you, there are two things. One is if you're in a direction, people have the right to rely on the fact that you're going to proceed logically in that direction and give them warning mm -hmm. as to whether you're changing, why you're changing and, and what's going to happen. And the second thing along the, the lines of this, and this is what I taught uh, my oldest when he learned to drive. It was the first lesson I taught him when he learned to drive. And that is that accidents tend to happen when you do something unexpected. Yeah. Because the other drivers have a right to anticipate what you're going to do. And if you if they have a reasonable expectation of what you're going to do and you don't hold with that, accidents happen. And in the business world, if you've set up reasonable expectations of how you're going to act or where you're going to proceed or what the direction you're going to be in or your thought process or decision making, all of those things, it doesn't mean you can't change lanes, but it does mean that you still have to put to on your give, blinker. Yeah, you have to put on your <laughs> blinker. You have to give them a right to expect and un understand mm -hmm. what you're doing. Yeah, this this uh, oof, I, I can think of like five different things that I want to hit on, and they all feel it feels like they're all contradictory to one another. But but I think that is why this is so important because it has different layers and shapes that mean different things in different places. So so one thing is is you know if your company if you're in a company that is very much in like startup mode it's different. Like this whole conversation is very different than if you're in a larger organization yeah. and like in startup mode, you're often, it's unfair to expect it to not be in kind of build the plane as you fly it. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, now we need to go this way. Now we need to go to not unnecessarily. So, but you have to like, but, but, but that's why I love the thing that you brought up about accidents happen when things are unexpected. You can set the expectation with your people that this will be a adaptable, quick pivot culture for yes. the next little while. So the expectation can be regular change, which gives right. people the option to say, because some people cannot deal with and you can regular say, change. If you're not comfortable with that, yes. then this isn't the right place for you. probably isn't the best place for you. So you're like, but you said, my kids are like that, but you said, I'm like, yeah, and life changes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I think there's that. And I think there's a lot of risk. I end up having a lot of conversations with people who get stuck in the, well, but I started down this path and now I have to be on it forever. So, yeah. so those are kind of two yes, buts to, to what you're saying. But <laughs> but three. a third, but three, three. How many buttons are we up to now? Um, there's 
there is something really, really important about this uh, where you, you can't just be like jerking the organization left and right and up and down and turn it around. And now we do this and now we do that. That without fail causes ripples in people that ne- that are never going to create the kind of behaviors that you want because people start to get protective and a little bit more CYA about their choices because they don't know what's expected and they don't have a North Star to decide by because things keep changing. So they don't know what to focus on. Yeah. I mean, we um, when we started um, a law firm that, that uh, I was a part of well before this one, one of the partners decided, you know, we're, we're young. We don't want to have all of these, these regulations and, and all of these policies. And so he decided that we would adopt the Outback Steakhouse slogan, no rules, just right. And he was telling people, you know, no rules, no, no rules. We're not going to be one of those organizations. <laughs> and we finally, I remember the partners meeting, we had to sit him down. We we're like, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> that no rules thing, not going to work. There are a whole bunch of rules. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, you can establish the expectations that you're going to pivot quickly or that the job that you're doing right now is not the job that you're going to be doing in three years. Well, and I think just to, to stick with the metaphor of the story that you started with, it is the perfect example is, is that the guy needed to turn right. Like he recognized that he needed to turn right. Mm-hmm. It's not that turning right is wrong right. because he needs, he needs to turn right. And he recognizes that. So if you're leading an org- organization, you can at the last minute when it's kind of a little bit too late to do it the way you most efficiently would have done it, realize that you need to go to the right. But then the decision has to become, okay, how do I do that in a way that doesn't wreak havoc all around me? Like I'm probably going to need to go to go down, have to make a left and a left and a, a left, and then we're going to be going in the right Right. Way. Who am I going right. to affect? What's the route that I have to take in order to accomplish this efficiency, yes. efficiently and with the least chance of chaos ensuing? And what unintended consequences should I perhaps consider? Like maybe there's a car behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which is crazy that he like he just literally couldn't see you. So right, but I, his yeah. best possible outcome, if I wasn't behind him, let's say it was clear behind him, mm-hmm. his best possible outcome was that he did it, he, he violated the norm quickly enough that he averted disaster, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. because he mm-hmm. needed to make sure he did it quickly enough so that oncoming traffic, which sure. would not anticipate a car backing up in that lane, right. didn't, you know, wasn't impeded either. So there were a thousand ways this could go wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I love, I love you bringing the, the whole traffic analogy of this is so useful because some of my most, I don't get road ragey very often, but, um, but there are like a certain things and we, we don't need to get into traffic circles right now, but that's one of them um, <laughs> is people who don't understand how traffic circles work um, and just sort of like timid driving in general. But but when people make choices that they're trying to be nice, like I can see the well intention, but but it's not the way it works. And therefore, it wreaks, you know, it causes havoc where it causes chaos where where you know, someone, you're the main road, you have the right of way to turn left or whatever. Well, they'll just decide they want to let people out. Right. It's confusing. And it, and it causes people to not know what other because everyone has to then make a decision in the moment about what rules that changes and whether you do it or not. Is there anything else I have to think and about? And what new rules this guy is going to follow? Is it two cars he's letting in or just or one? Or is he going to let us he, all out? Yeah. Like, because he's not following the basics. And it's so interesting because I'm not a heavily rules based person. So it, it's, I, I tend to operate better when it's just like, let's figure it out as we go. But there are things, there are places where there need to be rules and, and just sort of recognizing that they, we know what it reminds me of. Um, is it, oh my gosh, what's his name? The guy who does the energy project, um, Schwartz, Tony Schwartz. Um, he, he does a lot of work on in business, the way neuroscience, where your brain works and energy and right. all that kind of stuff. Really, really excellent stuff. Um, he has a whole book, I think, about habits and, and not habits like how to create habits in the way of like healthy habits, but it all comes back to this, everything that you can make a habit so that it can operate in the... Um, in the automatic kind part of, of your brain. Background. Yeah. Like you don't have to think about how to brush your teeth because, you know, so you can do other things where, you know, you right. can think about other you things can while think you're about brushing the upcoming your teeth. meeting while you're brushing your teeth. Yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's a habit. So, so the more that you can make certain things habits and you can kind of shove them back into the automatic part of your brain, then, then you have other time to do other things. So it's like an efficiency kind of, kind of thing. So 
it reminds me a tiny bit of that is that when you throw chaos, unexpected decisions into your organization, you're causing people to have to use their really important, useful neurons to now think about, oh, okay, what is this? They have to think about brushing their teeth because they're like, oh, wait, something's changing. What's happening? Like now, wait, 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 we're going to do what? And instead of being able to have those kind of expectations on autopilot, and then they can use their brain for good. <laughs> no, and that's and that's true. And so some of that um, I see in the HR sphere a lot. I see that people switch from, well, we're going to do 360 degree reviews mm. or mm-hmm. we're going to now have a flat organization chart and you can go into anybody you want to and you can talk to. And now we're going to put dotted lines to everyone. Dotted <laughs> lines to everybody and it's going to be completely transparent or you don't have to, whatever it is. And so all of a sudden there's um, confusion about who I'm supposed to, whose interests I'm supposed to look out for, what I'm supposed to be doing, what what constitutes the, not only the expectations for my job, but also defines success for my job. Mm -hmm. Because all of those automatic things, all of those things that I came to expect and understand about my position have now been called into question. Yeah. I mean, I I feel like every three sentences I want to reinforce, that doesn't mean you can't change things. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that everything's always going to be you know, um, it's, it's not like you can ever promise certainty and a clear path. I mean, that's just not how business works, but it reminds me of, um, I think there's a big difference between changing the circumstances and changing the destination, if that makes any sense. And then whipping around, um, there's, there's a big difference between like, um, adding in innovation in the way you do things versus innovating your business model over and over again. Yeah. It changes the game versus like changing a play in the game. And but you're still headed towards the same place. And I think that's where people start to get get confused a lot of times. And and also I did some work with an organization where um and it was it was a public company. And so as with all public companies, they have the very real, hard to ignore issues of quarterly reporting and you know for better or for worse it's it's a it's a not a burden it's not the word it's a um it's something that they can't just ignore and be like mm-hmm. oh who cares where our quarterly numbers come in however they were trying over you know, really really hard to make this longer term strategy and have people be thinking in longer term strategy and they were i was speaking to some of their leaders after this big corporate wide sales meeting and the leader of that organization in like in a two day sales meeting at like day 1.25. So like the morning of the second morning where they'd been talking about their longer term strategy, all of a sudden he has what I can only refer to based on their descriptions as kind of a panic moment where he's like, yeah, but what are we going to do about this quarter? And it, it had this exact same effect. Every person that, that sought me out after that meeting, they're like, we don't know what to focus. Like, we don't know. Right. It, it's, it's almost like the, the lab rats where they're like, I don't know if I press this lever if I'm because the things that were longer term strategy were very different than what they'd have to do to get this quarter's numbers up. And they're like, we're not sure what matters. And we're not sure what's going to get us shocked, you know, buzzed or what's going to get a piece of cheese. And we tried to get clarity and we just couldn't get him to land on it. And so, not only is that stressful for people, and not only does that detract from the ultimate success of an organization because people don't know where to focus, but but it's such a time and energy waste because people are sort of literally sitting there almost paralyzed is way too strong of a word, but they're a little bit like, um... But they get angry. And I'll, I'll <laughs> what give do I you do? an example. Earlier in, in my career, a, a lot earlier in my career, I was of counsel to this uh, law firm and... I, um, although I was young, uh, in the profession, I had a pretty good client base and, um, it turned out that I started bringing in more clients and more revenue than all but one of the partners. And there were seven partners in this, in this firm, but they called me down to the conference room after this one month. It was like on the second or first or second day of the uh, next month to talk about the last month. And they had never done that before. And I thought they were going to say, wow, you brought in all these clients and the revenue was great because I knew what the numbers were and they were better than the other partners. And I wasn't even a partner yet. But what they decided to focus on was that my billable hours were down. Hmm. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I brought in more <laughs> money than all of you but one at the table. Right. 
Anybody can do the billable hour. I brought in the work for people who can't bring in work, you know, and they can do that. Yeah, but we'd like to see your billable hours up and we, we want you to keep bringing in clients, but, and you can't, you can't do that. And I see that in my profession a lot where you have um, people, particularly in large firms, you have people on the partnership track and they're told you've got to hit this much productivity. You've got to hit 2,400 billable hours, et cetera, et cetera. And then an initiative will be announced about <laughs> nurturing clients, client touch, go out there and and don't bill for it, but just make them understand that we care about them and go go to different events and start putting in real time in, in sowing the seeds for future business development. Okay, but that means that I can't be six and a half instead hours behind what? the screen. Right, like you know? instead of what? Right, instead of what? So I've seen that, you know, people would, would all of a sudden, I thought I was on the partnership track because my billables were huge. Right. But wait a minute, now I have this client touch thing and I have to go and show this. Or even if it's not business development, if it's, we want you to be involved in the community, which is great. Mm-hmm. We yeah. want you to do all Makes of this stuff. Sense. Fine, but instead of what? Yeah. And that's the question that's often not answered. Yeah, I think I think initiative fatigue is is a very real thing to watch out for. Cause I think and and I've been I've been I've been guilty of this as well. I, I think what we all forget or can forget is that each idea it's it's like a, a, a triangle with the, the pointy end at the top. Like there's this spark of an idea, but then to actually implement that idea, it, it gets wider and wider. And what, you know, it's the, the task list that comes out of an idea or a project or an initiative is much, much, much bigger than just that idea. And when you're the further up you get, the more you're just sort of seeing the top of the ideas and not really appreciating what it takes to actually do the idea. And and, and at the same time, I, I know a lot of leaders get frustrated when what they always hear from their people is we don't have enough time, which I, I think is can also often be an excuse, you know, I mean, like, so, so it's, it's not a, a one way thing, but you have to sort of think through what is the unintended consequence of the, the, the amount of it, because, because there's, um, I'm sure we've mentioned this before, but in Stephen Covey's, um, the speed of trust, I think it is no wrong book, wrong book. Um, I don't know what book it's in, but in something that Stephen Covey did, <laughs> um, They have this, like if a company has between zero and three strategic initiatives, Mm -hmm. they'll usually accomplish two. If it's like four to six, they'll usually accomplish one. And if it's more than six, they'll accomplish zero. And it's that diffused effort and the lack of clarity that of what really matters. I, I feel like saying yes to a lot of re- saying saying no to a lot of really good decisions in order to say yes and be really good at just a couple of things is really the art of business success but oh my god it's so hard <laughs> yeah and especially when you have to decide some of those initiatives might be smaller and subcategories sure. or whatever but but some of them set the direction some yes. of them determine. Well, there's a difference between like now we're going to recycle instead of throwing everything in the trash. I mean, that that's sort of right. a subset of like, oh, okay, instead of tossing it there, I toss it over here. Yes. Versus like now we want you to be spending a substantive amount of your time doing something different than you were doing before. Right. Because you could decide to, to just carry that further. We're going to recycle instead of throwing it in the trash. And that's fine. You can have a different bin. You can educate people on that. But if you decide that you're going to go paperless, which is within the same Ooh, family. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, now you're really affecting people because yes. that's a significant change depending upon yeah. your industry. That's a significant, significant change. Significant change. And people want to know, well, wait a minute, if I do this, is that violating the policy? If I do that, what right. do, what does that mean? And that's that's where you yeah. cause eleven thousand dollars worth of damage to somebody's car. Yeah. Well, I will I will just toss in, never have I been a more irate parent than um than trash free lunch day. <laughs> As I literally unpacked unpacked things and put them into Tupperware that would come back home. I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever had to do. And I consider just not participating. But if you don't participate in trash free lunch day, then like any class who didn't have 100% participation didn't get to do pajama day. So I couldn't be the mom who like ruined pajama day for an entire class. So yeah. Anyway. I feel like that's a great title for a book. The mom who ruined pajama day. <laughs> that was almost me. <laughs> 
So that's our story. But the discussion doesn't have to end here. No, it does not. In fact, we don't want it to. No, we don't. (laughs) That is why we actually have our private Facebook group. Which we started to make sure that we could get your comments, your rants, your thoughts. Your stories. Your stories. You can find links to that group as well as show notes and links to subscribe via email and how to find us just about anywhere you can possibly find podcasts at SoHere'sMyStory.com. And you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at SHMS Podcast. And since we know it takes a village. Yes, it does. (laughs) We'd like to thank our village, our super talented, incredibly patient team. And occasionally snarky team. Yeah, but in the best of ways. In the best of ways. snarky. Yes. (laughs) Good mockery. So a huge shout out to the people who actually help us produce our show. Uh, First, our sound engineer, Tom Hansen. Thanks to Christy Schmier for our brilliant show notes and all the other fantastic writing she does for us. And to Taylor Mathauer for doing just a little bit of everything. Including wrangling us. Including wrangling us. (laughs) Which is no small feat. No, it's not. This is Jody Hume. And I'm Elliot Wagenheim. And you've been listening to So Here's My Story. 